to say to say that we're at a peak implies that things are downhill from here on. So uh, that's actually a pessimistic view. The uh, uh, all right, next speaker is Freeman Dyson. It is easy to say that Freeman Dyson needs no introduction, so I will be very brief. He came here right after what our generation calls the war, it's like World War II, uh, and quickly made a great contribution to quantum electrodynamics, for which he became quite well known. He then proceeded to explore many, many aspects of science and scientific policy uh, across decades of books, talks, and famously, a lot of book reviews. The uh, subjects he's treated have been uh, everything that's in this uh, symposium and many, many others having to do with nuclear policy and technology. Um, so uh, without further ado, Professor Freeman Dyson. Now the first time I remember reading about this, 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 uh, this world that, that we're moving into was the, the story Rescue Party by Arthur Clarke, one of the finest stories he ever wrote. Maybe it was one of the first he wrote, a marvelous story about uh, the alternative three in your list, saving civilization just with a little bit of engineering. And it's, it's just so, so beautifully described, and I've always, ever since, I've, I've, I've always believed in that. It's, um, I'm going to read from a text because I, I don't have the discipline to talk freely and get through in the time. If, if I talk freely, it will take twice as long. So I'll just kick off. I want to talk about two things, the, the sort of the near future and the far future. The near future being solar system, the far future being the rest of the universe. So roughly 50 years is what I consider the near future, 500 the far future for the, for the present discussion. So we're in the beginning of a, revelation, of a revolution in space technology when for the first time cheapness will be mandatory. Missions that are not cheap will not fly. This is bad news for space explorers in the short run, good news in the long run, bad news for the space station, bad news for manned missions to Mars carried out with existing technology, which cost as much as Apollo. Missions costing tens of billions of dollars are a dead end, like Apollo, because they cannot be sustained. Good news for all the new technologies that are waiting to be developed as soon as cheapness is mandatory. Good news for a nimble two-seater two version of the shuttle resembling a sports car rather than a Greyhound bus. Good news for autonomous spacecraft using modern sensors and computers and software on board to do their own navigation and housekeeping without a standing army of expensive people on the ground to take care of them. Good news for inflatable structures deployed in space by blowing up big balloons. Good news for new and more efficient systems of propulsion. Good news for solar electric propulsion and solar sails, low thrust systems for long voyages. Good news for the ram accelerator, a cheap high acceleration system for launching bulk cargo from the ground. Good news for mass drivers and slingatrons cheap and simple machines for launching cargo from the moon or asteroids. This list of promising new technologies makes no claim to be complete. Apologies to the promoters of other new technologies that I omitted. Some of them will win and some will lose. The good news is that cheapness now has a chance. The coming era of cheap space operations will begin with unmanned missions. Cheap manned missions will come later, after unmanned missions have tested and debugged. the new technologies. Cheap unmanned missions only require new engineering. 
Cheap manned missions will require new biotechnology. For a manned mission, the, 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 the chief problem is not getting there, but learning how to survive after you got there. To survive and make yourself a home away from the Earth is a problem of biology rather than engineering. It's easy to predict that cheap missions, both unmanned and manned, will ultimately be possible. There's no law of physics or biology that forbids cheap travel and cheap settlement all over the solar system and beyond. But it's impossible how to, to predict how long this will take. Predictions of the dates of future achievements are notoriously fallible. My own guess is the next 50 years will be the era of cheap unmanned missions. Cheap manned missions will start sometime late in the 21st century. The time these things take will depend on unforeseeable accidents. My date for the beginning of cheap manned missions is based on a historical analogy. From Columbus' first voyage to the settlement of the Pilgrims in Massachusetts was 128 years. So I'm guessing 2085, 128 years after the launch of the first Sputnik, private settlement of pilgrims all over the solar systems will be in, will, will be in progress. Meanwhile, we're doing well with unmanned missions. The latest triumph is the Kepler mission, discovering planets in huge numbers and revealing a new universe in which planets are more abundant than stars. Kepler is a revolution in astronomy, and it is a comparatively cheap mission. It only sends back scientific data instead of beautiful pictures. It turns out that scientific data is a lot cheaper than beautiful pictures. <laughs> the most demanding unmanned missions are voyages to the planets. For 40 years, the planetary missions, Mariner and Viking and Magellan and Voyager and Galileo and Cassini have been exploring the solar system and making enormous contributions to science. But in the last 10 years, planetary missions have been few and far between because they have become inordinately expensive. When each mission costs a billion dollars or more, the program is in serious trouble. The fundamental reason why space science missions became expensive was the imbalance in funding between ground-based and space-based science. For 40 years, all through the, 20th, the second half of the 20th century, it was politically easier to obtain $10 for a space science mission than to obtain $1 to do astronomy on the ground. Under those rules, ground-based astronomy became parsimonious while space science became extravagant. The unfair competition injured both parties, starving ground-based astronomy and spoiling space science. The injury to space science was greater. Ground-based astronomy flourished in spite of starvation, while planetary missions almost ground to a halt in spite of big budgets. The rules are now changing in the direction of fair competition. This means that planet planetary missions will in future be cheap. And once the barrier of high cost is broken, missions will be more frequent and the pace of discovery will be faster. I'm particularly interested in orbiter missions that could be flown cheaply using autonomous spacecraft. They would give us the chance to explore in detail the planets and satellites that were only glimpsed in earlier missions. First, an EO orbiter giving us detailed pictures of active volcanoes that were missed by Galileo because of the failure of an antenna and a tape recorder. Next, a Europa orbiter, searching for freeze-dried fish splashed onto the icy surface by asteroid impacts that penetrated the ice. Next, a Titan orbiter, carrying a synthetic aperture radar to map the surface below the clouds, giving us spectacular views of the topography of Titan, just as Magellan did at Venus. Next, orbiters of Uranus and Neptune to explore those planets and their satellites. Last and most difficult, a Pluto orbiter, 
And while those orbiters are flying, a fleet of similar spacecraft could be doing rendezvous missions to asteroids and comets, first in the inner regions of the solar system and then in the main asteroid belt, later in the Kuiper belt of comets beyond Neptune. The objective is to fly missions that are scientifically as productive as Galileo or Cassini, but cheaper by a factor of 10. To achieve a reduction of costs by a factor of 10 is not easy, but it can be done if the alternative is bankruptcy. Three innovations are crucial. First, miniaturization of the payload, including instruments, communications, and structure. Second, autonomous operation. Third, mass production and frequent use of the same basic design. The reasons I'm op optimistic about drastically reduced costs is that the interests of science and politics here coincide. Cheap and frequent missions will bring a second golden age of exploration within a budget smaller than the space science budget of today. Some years ago, I spent some time with the Neptune Orbiter Design Group at JPL. Neptune Orbiter was chosen for intensive study because it is a tough mission stretching the technologies that are required for orbiters. It needs a high-performance version of solar electric propulsion to arrive at Neptune in five years, and it needs a high-performance version of atmospheric braking to reduce the speed just enough to be captured into orbit. The braking maneuver using the drag of Neptune's atmosphere to dissipate a large velocity is the most sporty part of the mission. By that time, if all goes well, such orbiter missions will already have been flown. EO Orbiter will have tested the atmospheric braking system in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Lessons learned in the earlier missions will help us to ask the right questions at Neptune. Our scientific understanding of the solar system as a whole will be advanced much more by a series of modest missions than by trying to answer big questions with a single big mission. Big one-shot missions are not a cost-effective way of doing science. When we come to settle the solar system with people in the later years of the 21st century, we, we will already have explored the terrain thoroughly with unmanned missions. The people who decide to go to Europa or Enceladus will know why they decided to go there and roughly what to expect when they get there. The most important part of their luggage will be the seeds of plants and animals genetically programmed to be capable of survival in an alien climate. On a world that lacks an atmosphere, the most useful plants will be those that grow greenhouses around themselves, allowing them to keep warm by the light from a distant sun and conserve the oxygen that they produce by photosynthesis. Plants could be engineered to grow greenhouses just as turtles grow shells or polar bears grow fur. Plants as large as trees could grow greenhouses big enough for humans to live in. If the human settlers are wise, they will arrive to move into homes already prepared for them by an ecology of plants and animals introduced by unmanned missions. The essential requirements for a successful colony will be a deep understanding of the local ecology so that humans can become a part of the ecology without destroying it. The Biosphere 2 experiment was a valuable object lesson, teaching us how humans, without sufficient understanding of their habitat, could unexpectedly run out of air to breathe. Why should anybody want to live on Europa or Enceladus? The only answer we give to this question is the answer George Mallory gave to the question why he wanted to climb Everest, because it's there. There may be economic reasons, scientific reasons, or sentimental reasons attracting people to remote places. People always have a variety of reasons for moving from one place to another. But one of the few constant factors in human history is the fact that people do migrate. They cover huge distances for reasons that are difficult to discern. 
As soon as emigration from Earth becomes cheap enough for ordinary people to afford, people will migrate. To make human space travel cheap, we shall need advanced biotechnology in addition to advanced propulsion. And we shall need a large number of travelers to bring down the cost of a ticket. That's why human space travel won't be cheap until 50 or 100 years have gone by. It could well happen within a few hundred years that most of the inhabitants of the solar system will be living in the Kuiper belt. Accustomed as we are to living on a high gravity planet close to the sun, it's difficult for us to imagine what it will be like to live in, in low gravity far away. One simple trick for making life comfortable in the Kuiper belt will be to deploy large mirrors in space to collect sunlight. An array of mirrors 100 kilometers in diameter, not required to be optically perfect, would collect a steady 1,000 megawatts anywhere in the Kuiper belt out to three times the distance of Neptune. That's enough energy to sustain a considerable population of plants and animals and humans with all modern conveniences. The cost, the material out of which to construct the mirrors a few thousand tons of metal and plastic will be available on, a, on any Kuiper Belt object. After a century of progress in biotech, we won't even need to manufacture the mirror. We will teach our plants to grow it. Life in the Kuiper Belt will be different from life on Earth, but it won't be less beautiful or more confined. Well, that's my spiel about the solar system now I come to the, the second part, which is beyond the solar system. There's no reason to believe that the space between the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt is empty. Let me just check on the time. So we have about 10, 10, 10 minutes to go, but I'll probably run a bit over that. We know that a large fraction of all stars are born with planetary systems. It's likely that large numbers of planets are also born unattached to stars. And we know that the normal process of formation and evolution of planetary systems results in the ejection of planets and of comets from the system. As a result of these processes, the universe probably contains more unattached planets than stars and billions of times more unattached comets. The space between our solar system and the, non, and the nearest stars is probably infested with unattached planets and far more numerous unattached comets. In addition, there may be other objects of intermediate kinds which we have not yet observed, from snowballs to black dwarf stars. It's quite conceivable that some of the intermediate objects might be alive a population of mythological monsters making their home in space. The Polynesians were navigating the Pacific for a thousand years before the Europeans crossed the Atlantic. Island hopping came first, intercontinental voyages later. It's likely that the future of our traveling beyond the solar system will follow the same pattern. The evolution of starships like the evolution of Polynesian canoes and European galleons, will proceed by a process of trial and error. Unattached comets and planets will be like the islands in the Pacific Ocean. We will begin like the Polynesian navigators, modestly, developing starships one step at a time. We can learn from our mistakes how to do the job right. Perhaps after a thousand years, we will, be, we will be ready to build the grand new superhighways that convey traffic along non-stop routes from star to star. Two things are needed to make starships fly, a place to go and a way to get there. The first problem is mainly a problem of biology, the second a problem of engineering. So I look at biology first. To have a place to go, we must learn to grow complete ecosystems 
at remote places in the universe. It is not enough to have hotels for humans. We must establish permanent ecological communities, including microbes and plants and animals, adapted to survive in the local environment. The populations of the various species must be balanced so as to take care of each other's needs. Permanent human settlement away from the Earth only makes sense if it's part of a much bigger enterprise, the permanent expansion of life as a whole. The best way to build human habitats is to prepare the ground by building robust local ecologies. After life has established itself with grass and trees, herbivores and carnivores, bacteria and viruses, humans can arrive and build homes in a friendly environment. There's no future for humans tramping around in clumsy space suits on a lifeless landscape of dust and ice. Looking ahead 50 or 100 years, we shall be learning how to use genetic information creatively. We shall then be in a position to design biosphere populations adapted to survive and prosper in various environments. For each location, we could design a biosphere genome, and for each biosphere genome, we could design an egg out of which an entire biosphere could grow. The egg might weigh a few kilograms and look from the outside like an ostrich egg. It would be a miniature Noah's Ark containing thousands or millions of microscopic eggs programmed to grow into the various species of a biosphere. It could also contain nutrients and life support to enable the growth of the biosphere to get started. The first species to emerge from a Noah's Ark would be warm-blooded plants designed to collect energy from sunlight and keep themselves warm in a cold environment. Warm-blooded plants would then provide warmth and shelter for other creatures to enjoy. In this way, life could be seeded in great abundance and in great variety in all kinds of places, traveling on small spacecraft carrying payloads of a few kilograms. Since life is inherently an unpredictable phenomenon, many of the biospheres would fail and die. Those that survived would evolve in unpredictable ways. Their evolution would continue forever, with or without human intervention. We would be the midwives, bringing life to birth all over the universe, as far as our Noah's Ark eggs could travel. The second problem, the problem of engineering, is to build machines that can take us from here to there. To have space travel over long distances at reasonable prices, we must build a public highway system so that the costs of the initial investment can be shared by a multitude of users. A public highway system in space will require terminals using sunlight or starlight to generate high energy beams along which the spacecraft can fly. The beams may be laser beams or microwave beams or pellet streams. The massive en energy generating machinery at the terminals will remain fixed. The spacecraft will be small and light and pick up the energy from the beams as they fly along. Unlike chemical or nuclear rockets, they do not carry their own fuel. For the system to operate efficiently, the volume of traffic must be big enough to use up the energy of the beams. Spacecraft must be flying along the beams almost all the time. The cost of travel will be high at the beginning and will become low when every terminal is crowded with passengers. In the future, when missions go beyond the solar system, the difference between passengers and freight will be inverted. Freight will no longer be heavy. It will no longer be bulk materials such as fuel and water. Freight will be information embodied in ultralight computing memory or in DNA. Freight will be several orders of magnitude lighter than human passengers. Payloads of unmanned missions may be measured in grams 
while payloads of manned missions will always be measured in tons. As a result, the public highway system will consist of two parts, a heavy-duty system transporting human passengers between a small number of metropolitan human habitats, and a light freight system transporting packages of information along a wider network of routes to more distant destinations. A typical light freight mission might be like the Star Wisp proposed by Bob Forward. The Star Wisp is an ultralight sail made of fine, fine wire mesh driven through space by a, a high-powered beam of microwaves. The wire mesh is not only the vehicle but also the payload, carrying sensors to explore the environment and transmitters to send the information collected by the sensors to humans far away. Star Wisp could also be a vehicle for carrying a Noah's Ark egg to bring life to a remote place. It is likely that the travel times of voyages will become longer than a human lifetime. After life has spread that far, it will no longer make sense for humans to travel with it. Instead of engine imprisoning human travelers for a lifetime in a spacecraft, it would make much more sense to send the spacecraft with a few human eggs, which could grow into humans at the destination. In the end, we would populate the galaxy by broadcasting the information required for growing humans rather than by carrying deep frozen human bodies for thousands of years. The new technology for bringing life to small, cold objects in space is the cultivation of warm-blooded plants. Warm-blooded plants are more essential to the ecology of cold places than warm-blooded animals are to the ecology of our warm planet. Life on Earth might have evolved happily without birds and mammals, but life in a cold place could never get started without warm-blooded plants. Two external structures make warm-blooded plants possible, a greenhouse and a mirror. The greenhouse is an insulating shell protecting the warm interior from the cold outside with a semi-transparent window allowing sunlight or starlight to come in but preventing heat radiation from going out. The mirror is an optical reflector or system of reflectors in the cold outside the greenhouse concentrating sunlight or starlight from a wide area onto the window. Inside the greenhouse are the normal structures of a terrestrial plant, leaves using the energy of incoming light for photosynthesis, and roots reaching down into the icy ground to find nutrient minerals. Since there's no atmosphere to supply the plant with carbon dioxide, the roots must find mineral resources for carbon and oxygen to stay alive. We see in the light emitted from comets as they come close to the sun that these icy objects contain plenty of carbon and oxygen as well as nitrogen and other elements essential to life. The embryonic warm-blooded plant must grow the greenhouse and the mirror around itself while still protected within the greenhouse of its parent. The seeds must develop into viable plants before they are dispersed into the cold environment. These plants must be viviparous as well as warm-blooded. It seems to be only an accident of evolution on our own planet that animals learned to be viviparous and warm-blooded plants did not. These speculations about viviparous plants and Noah's Ark eggs and life spreading through the galaxy are my personal fantasies. There are only one possible way for the future to go. The real future is unpredictable. It will be rich in surprises that we have not imagined. All we can say with some confidence is that biotechnology will dominate the future. The awesome power of nature to evolve unlimited diversity of ways of living 
will be in our hands. It's for us to choose how to use this power for good or for evil. Thank you. Yes. Yes, so questions or objections, yes. Preferred methods of detecting them. Well, yes, that's of course my business. The, 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 uh, the, 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 the Kepler, of course, was a wonderful device. It's exactly what you need. There's a, another way of doing it, which I find very exciting, is looking at white dwarfs. If you had a white dwarf star, it's the same size as a planet. So it means if a planet goes in front of it, you see a eclipse of the white dwarf, which is, uh, t takes away 100% or 50% of the light. So it's much easier to detect from the ground. So amateurs, in fact, could be doing this. I've been encouraging some of my amateur astronomer friends actually to get started. This is something we could, could be doing right now. The trouble with white dwarfs is they're not concentrated in one part of the sky. Kepler only looks at one very small region of the sky. It's just pointed in one direction. So it looks, all, it looks at all the stars within that narrow re region. Whereas if you want to look at white dwarfs, you have to look in many different directions, which is ideal for astronomers, uh, amateur astronomers who have small telescopes. The one thing amateurs have, which the professionals don't, is time. So in fact, I, I, amateur astronomers are well set up for this. You only need something like a 12-inch telescope to see a white dwarf down to magnitude 19 or so, and you could certainly see one of these transits of planets coming in front of it. And then... Yes. Right, and that's of course also true that you would see others, uh, anything in between, even if it's not attached to the star. And you can look for gravitational lens effects, which are also quite possible to see. And, uh, but the, the, uh, the point is to get it on a mass basis so you're not depending on a few big missions, but on the population of amateurs, which is now rapidly advancing in technology. The amateurs today are about as well instrumented as professionals were 10 years ago, and that's likely to continue. I mean, a typical amateur astronomer now can operate robotically, which you could not do 10 years ago. That makes a huge difference. You can observe all night long without having to stay up. That's actually... <laughs> yes. So it's a question, of course. I mean, the ethics of exploring is always problematic. You don't know whether you're going to destroy a civilization by arriving in some place. And that's a, a, that, that's a risk that people will take. And I, I myself have a sort of laissez-faire view of it that uh, people are going to do it anyway. We, all we can do is to legislate as far as one can, but try to protect the natives if it's possible but you won't protect them just by putting up a, a red flag and saying you mustn't go. All right, uh, thank you, Professor Davis. Um, here's that page I had for you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have an unannounced, until now, break.